So thank you all for joining us again. Um, I just want to welcome our presenters who are ISPCAN counselors, um, and I'm very proud that they could um, do this presentation today on abuse in medical settings. So I welcome Sue Foley and Des Runyons as, our host, as your guest presenters for today. Sue Foley is an accredited senior clinical social worker from the Department of Psychological Medicine at the Children's Hospital in Westmead, Australia. Sue is also the Children's Court Clinician and Family Court Report Writer. Her clinical experience in assessing and providing services to children and families covers the years from 1972 to the present. So we're very happy to have her today. Also um, on our panel is Des Runyon, who is the Executive Director of the Kemp Center at the Children's Hospital of Colorado. He is also a professor of pediatrics. De Dr. Runyon's research has addressed the identification and consequences of child abuse and neglect. In 1989, he designed and secured funding for one of the longest multi-site perspective studies of the consequences of child abuse called Long Scan, and this study has continued for more than 20 years. So, I just want us to pause here for a moment and let you know to how you can participate in today's webinar. During the presentation, we're going to keep all of our attendees muted so that we can have the presentation completed and we can minimize any background noise. And at, as you have questions, we would encourage you to please type your questions into the menu bar on the right-hand side of your screen. And at the end of the presentation, we'll be reading those questions to our presenters who will address them one by one. So thank you again for joining us today, and we are going to get started. So thank you, Sue, and I'm going to give it, turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pranasi, and um, hello to um, those of you who are listening in either um, by um, having looked at it online after we've finished this presentation and those who are there now. So um, I'm in Sydney, Australia where it's 8 o'clock in the morning and I understand that um, in Denver it's about 4 p.m. So uh, quite a lot of the world are sleeping and um, I'm hopeful that you will enjoy this presentation. Um, next, uh, how to say next slide, next one. Um, so um, we're both ISPA Count Councillors, as Pragathy just um, advised, and uh, we've both been involved with ISPA Count for many, many years. Um, I have a commitment to finding out when we can make a change to the impact of um, children and families on them of abuse. And I'm keen to do that because I think we haven't done a very good um, way of doing that. The numbers still are still worrying, although in some areas of child protection they have um, gone down. Um, but uh, yesterday I was talking to one of our judges and saying that I actually think this area of work, working in medical settings where children do experience a range of abuse, which we're going to talk about, um, the problem is these people don't get access to the kind of help that they need. Um, so I am a social worker and I'm now this director and so I have an opportunity to influence some of that practice and I hope that we'll be able to share some ideas about that today. Next one, thanks. So I've worked at a number of agencies and I just want to pull this together just in case there are people who are from uh, child abuse agencies here, they're called DOCS or FACS and I know around the world they're called different things. Um, I've also worked in various hospitals. So today I'm bringing um, to this discussion my experience both in identifying a, a factitious illness by proxy or Munchausen by proxy or health anxiety, all of those words apply, um, and hopefully we can pull this together because my theme about working in this area is we cannot ever do it on our own. Um, so uh, perhaps we could now um, hear from Des about him. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on what part of the world you're in. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Des Runyon, as Sue said. I'm a pediatrician at, in Denver at the Kemp Center, um, and I've been involved with over 35 years of doing medical evaluations and um, treatment of children who have been victims of abuse or neglect, as well as being a general pediatrician. And I'm happy to be a discussant, and I think the way we're going to work this is I'll 
um, pipe up every once in a while to add gravitas, that, whatever gravitas I have, to what Sue says. But uh, Sue's the leader of this one. Thank you. And we often do present together because I think we're a bit of a match. Uh, you know, sometimes um, practitioners and um, researchers don't really get to talk at this level, and Des and I have been debating and talking for many years, so um, that's pretty exciting. Thanks. Next slide. So um, the issue of prevention in um, factitious illness by proxy, Munchausen syndrome by proxy, and mental abuse—sorry, uh, medical abuse by proxy—much um, of this is about how it's identified and prosecuted, and other legal matters. And uh, you know, it's a very scary um, kind of um, child abuse because you know. Between over 25% of, of people um, do serious damage, and some children even die. And uh, we've got a, n a number of matters. I'm actually sitting in a court building at the moment, and I know there's a number of matters before the court. And I myself have been involved in a matter where um, a child died. And I hope I'll be able to um, uh, show, show you or let you listen to a part of a film about that. Um, so please add your questions um, for the moderator, and also please. Um, uh, feel free to, to, to challenge some of the ideas that we present. Thank you. Next. Um, so um, this is a question uh, for you to think about. How many of you ever had to manage or be involved with one of these cases? And uh, Des and I were talking just before we started about um, the percentage of, of these kind of cases that are in America, what kind of names they're called. Do you want to comment on that, Des? Sure. When we looked a number of years ago trying to figure out what the, how often this came through Child Protective Services to the population, we basically concluded that this was a, there was about one case in 100,000 children per year in our experience in North Carolina. So it's a relatively rare form of child abuse. Um, but as Sue has said, it has very serious consequences. There's actually a spectrum of a larger group of folks that I've sometimes wondered about which is parents who present their children without the full truth to the doctor um, overlaying the symptoms or making it sound worse than it is in order to get the doctor's attention, which isn't really quite what we're talking about, but we wonder it would be an upper bound estimate of how often this happens. But I'll come back to that later. Go ahead, Sue. Okay, so um, we we went to, in trying to figure out how we establish um, some boundaries or some parameters of uh, recognising the difference between that group that Des just mentioned, the ones who exaggerate or, um, in the words of my general practitioner who I was talking to the other day, he said to me he hates working with these cases because he doesn't like working with people who lie because it confuses him. And I think that's how um, people generally think about this issue. Um, so there was a framework that we started to look at, and this is this one by Boots, and the references will be on these slides, um, that it, illness in a child which is fabricated by a parent or someone in loco parentis, which might be foster carers or um, grandparents. Um, and the child is usually presented for a medical assessment and care, and usually persistently, and that might result in multiple medical procedures. Um, and those procedures can include all sorts of intrusive stuff and less intrusive stuff, and may even include um, inappropriate medication. Usually, when there's a discussion about the symptoms with the person involved, mm. the carer, um, this, his language is perpetrator, I don't like that much, but I'm a social worker, um, denies the knowledge of the cause or the etiology of the illness. So how come this child is having seizures, or how come this child is covered in in a rash, or how come not going to school and having, um, you know, respiratory problems? And there's all, often a lot of complex psychosocial components to that. Um, and the the if it's a true um, uh, factitious illness, then the acute signs and symptoms decrease when the child's separated from the perpetrator or the, the carer. And that used to be um, the sort of diagnostic. Um, tool. So one of the families I had, when they brought the child into hospital, the symptoms disappeared um, and they, they were no longer an issue for medical practitioners. Now there could be other reasons for that, but that's the kind of process that people engage in. 
The questions that we started to ask working in psychological medicine um, was what's the motivation for this kind of abuse? What, why would people do this? And I, you know, while I think that's a question we should ask about all forms of abuse, um, in particular in this one it's around um, attention. Is that what we're talking about? Is it around um, relationship issues? Is someone seeking some help for themselves? So kind of like projecting their own problems into the child so someone else can be, get close to them and provide them with help. And from a sort of psychological, psychodynamic point of view, um, that's one of the ways that we've thought about motivation. Uh, I think uh, I'll come to talk to this a little more, but we talk a lot about anxiety in the parents. Um, and we know also that for many of these parents, struggles with um, psychosocial environments as well. Um, but Des, do you want to talk about from a medical perspective? Have you heard what people say about the, the etiology and factors around its existence? Sure, happy to jump in. <clears throat> so the, when Roy Meadow first described his version of this factitious illness, calling it Munchausen syndrome by proxy, the discussion was about the motivation of the parent, usually the mother and virtually all the reported cases, uh, who was trying to put herself in a position of being the angel of mercy or the savior and the, the intent was to hypertrophy her role by taking on by making a child sick and being the mother of a sick child. It's an interesting perspective but one that's a little hard to prove. Um, there used to be an old television show that said only the shadow knows what lurks in the hearts of men uh, and trying to figure out what the motivation uh, that someone is doing it for is probably a step too far in most cases. Um, but clearly there are motivations to to make the mother more important to or to harm the child or to put somebody else in an un, uh, untenable position. So there are lots of different reasons for that. And I think the medical professionals involved in this have tried to get away from interpreting motivation and addressing in fact just what the acts are that are being done. Yeah, um, I agree. I think that's the way um, medically one needs to work with it. Um, from my perspective as a therapist, I probably am interested in, in some of the hypotheses that might be there about how you can get in early and I'll come and show what, how that's come from. And the, the British um, Pediatric Guidance to has a good look at that as well. Um, and, and an ISPCAN member who I met, um, I think it's I don't know if it's Christopher Bulls who may well have been uh, writing about this. I met him at an ISPCAN conference and he did his PhD looking at a longitudinal study and trying to understand what are the, the motivations and what are the social um, surrounding impacts. And some of them are on the next slide, so we can go to that. Um, and uh, so uh, I think um, various ISPCAN members have been involved in some of that British document and talking about overly caring parents. So they are people who exaggerate the symptom. Instead of seeing something as a normal childhood illness, it becomes a sign that they might be going to get cancer or a sign that they're too sick to go to school. And then there's often other things around that. Mum might have had anxiety about school and so this all links in together. From a behavioural point of view, she's just being not a good enough mum. Um, but from another perspective, it might be that she's overly caring and overly anxious. Um, I've seen, in the cases that I've seen, and I've seen many since the mid-80s, they're often terrified parents and they're parents who are um, scared of something. So one of the cases I was involved in, both of the parents had died from, the parents of the parents had died from a respiratory illness and they were both very um, traumatised by this. And so when they had a little baby who within a couple of days of her birth developed some serious respiratory conditions, um, their, their thinking brain lost the plot and they really could not manage that and until she was seven things got really tough and she was going to school with an oxygen tank because it all, their thinking got very disorganised and then you throw in a couple of um, variety of medical practitioners who give a variety of opinions and then we, we create a very complicated system with multiple doctors involved. Um, in all the cases that I've been involved, there's been some level of absent fathers. Um, some of them have had domestic violence, but not all. And absent fathers meaning um, either very work addicted fathers or um, 
fathers who've got mental health or drug and alcohol problems. These are just the, the, the sample that I've had. Um, we also had an over-engaged mum who didn't have anything else to be engaged with. So that helped them to have an over-identification with their child. And the reason we tease these out in, in the program that I was working in was that we wanted to work out where are the points of intervention. And importantly, and I think this comes up a lot, many of the people have, an, have an more than average knowledge of medical issues. Now, when I first started getting involved, the internet wasn't even around. So we're talking about people who'd done some nursing or who'd done, who had a fascination with medical stuff. Um, one of the mums in my case used to sit beside the twins that she was involved in uh, with and um, read large medical books to check up on everything that was going on around her. And meantime, um, there'd been a child who died and another one serious brain in injury. And you'll hear about her in a minute. Um, and perhaps the parents become too strong as advocates. And so in order to be advocates for resources, um, they may um, exaggerate a child's illness. Now, the worst case scenario is they cause an injury to get them more um, sympathy or more money or more resources. So some of the cases I've seen have had every one of those and some of them have had some of them. Um, does that, do you agree with that, Deb? Yeah, I think Sue has, has identified all the things. I, I've seen families in which I thought the parents' own past history uh, put them in position to kind of over-interpret illness or signs of illness or make it far worse and to trigger lots of attention that which would fit into the the terrified overly caring parents but I've also had a mother who was suffocating a child with her hand um, trying to hide from the camera that was it to try and convince everybody that her kid was sick and the cases in between so there's a variety in the spectrum that we need to think about um, and uh, some of the spe some specialists here, Donald and Jury Dini, actually talked about um, how one understands the role of the doctors in that process, um, and that is that sometimes these um, parents do have severe personality um, issues, as in they they're looking for care, um, and then they engage others in looking after them by exaggerating the symptoms. So the question is, of course, is it child abuse? Um, it is in that it can have horrific consequences. Um, and so uh, Chris Bass and David Jones say it's a rare form of child abuse, as Des mentioned, but relatively little is known about the psychopathology of the perpetrators. And uh, that, that's been part of our interest in, in this department that I was working in. Um, it is usually recognised a form of physical, emotional and psychological child abuse. And while I said there's a few cases happening at the moment, um, in fact, what um, I think the change is, there was a time when um, legal systems found it very difficult to see that Munchausen by proxy or factitious illness, or whatever the name, and it seems to change every few years, um, how one might prosecute it. And I have been involved with a few cases where a mum actually tried to suffocate two children to cause them to have epileptic fits. And, and uh, she actually went to jail. And another mum um, who also caused, that, caused injury and serious harm to her children. Um, so it was definitely physical abuse. Um, it's definitely emotional and psychological abuse in that children who think that they're very sick, it affects their whole sense of self and their whole self-esteem. Um, and often there's educational neglect that comes along as well. Um, so when we've done assessments of these families, we've often tried to understand on one hand, what are the adult factors that contribute to their behaviour um, and hold in mind the, the behavioural and, and actual facts that one needs to keep a child safe from or within. Um, many of the people that I've seen, the mums and uh, dads less so, um, but they've had also had experience of being um, victims themselves of exaggerated um, medical things or even sexual abuse, a lot of sexual abuse in our sample. Um, and some of them also have a high sense of somatization. So they don't actually have the mental health skills to manage their own emotional distress and they internalize it or exaggerate it and uh, therefore are suffering from some form of Munchausen themselves. So one of the mums I had actually 
um, suffered a lot from sexual abuse and then as a teenager injected herself um, with various substances like metal polish and stuff, which made her very sick, obviously. Um, and other mums who also um, had, uh, one of the mums that we've written out in one of our articles actually had a, a rare um, gynecological condition that she inherited. And so when her child was heading towards puberty, um, her anxiety went through the roof. She didn't actually cause any harm except that child can go to school for a year. So it's those kind of uh, concomitant factors. Okay, next one. Next slide. The next slide talks about um, um, the account of uh, a young woman who talks about her own story growing up and uh, um, came across this when I was trying to understand what is the impact on, on children. And uh, I, I thought this description kind of starts the story I was conceived in the sickly womb of a sickly mother who starved herself and in turn starved me. She was highly anemic and blind with toxemia at the time of my birth. My guess would be that she probably had some kind of The result, she explained, of high blood pressure, cutting off the circulation to her eyes. I was pushed into this world premature at three pounds, seven ounces, an embryonic little bird glowing translucently. After that, my health only balanced precariously on the edge of let's get the bottom of what's wrong with this kid kind of existence. So I think that's quite telling of the of the um, secondary effects. Do you want to comment on that, Des? Sorry, I had it on mute. Um, ah. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot to say. I think the um, you know, the parents care for the children a great deal. Um, and are doing things that try and make their own role or their child, in some way they're trying to help their child. I don't think that this is very often a case in which they're actually trying to harm the child irrevocably, although that does happen and there are some more serious cases in which children die from this. Um, but I think it's, um, and from the child's perspective, it's a little hard to understand, but. And some of the children that I've dealt with have not wanted to view their parent as potentially doing anything wrong and have, even in therapy, have viewed their mother as the person that was right and who was wronged by the system. Yeah, and very protective, yeah. So um, the next slide. So the literature actually talks about intentional creation or exaggerated symptoms. Um, Oh, sorry for the typo, without understanding um, the implications. So I think I think there's a range, and that's what I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, it's often considered in black and white terms and conceptualised only as a form of child abuse rather than um, uh, a disorder of parenting. Um, and the other little interesting comment is around um, whether, in fact, people have to admit to abuse before it can be treated. And I think there's some knowledge coming to us from our neurobiological uh, experts that kind of talks about that distorted perceptions and distorted cognitions are often affected by traumatic memories and that they can affect the way that people understand it. And so uh, I think at an ISPCAN conference maybe uh, a few years ago we had um, a psychiatrist talking about talk to the amygdala. So he was actually saying we need to stop thinking we can have a logical discussion with people who are distressed. We need to actually think about how we actually calm their distress and then turn on their cognition. And yet the legal systems and even the assessment systems don't think like that. Um, and, and we came to the conclusion that just going straight for behaviour without addressing some of the emotional issues um, creates some problems in change. Okay, next slide. So um, this next slide um, is, is, uh, takes a bit more uh, thinking through than we've got time to do, but it gives a kind of a picture of all the different ways in which we look at acknowledgement of what people do. And I think in this uh, complex system of uh, factitious or Munchausen, um, we see people at all different levels. And I have to say that even the people that we would consider we had done successful interventions with, um, no one made a full admission. Basically, I don't think they were able to. Um, but um, uh, we're talking about whether people fully acknowledge cause the harm and fully engage, very rare in any child protection work. Um, whether they accept that what they do has the capacity to cause harm, I think that's important for them to stop behaviour. Do they accept help 
but don't necessarily accept that they've done harm, well, there's a shift that probably needs to happen. Do they engage with intervention and adhere to treatment, um, but don't necessarily accept help, and there are some of those people. Um, do they accept help because maybe they need help, but they don't really accept that they caused harm? Um, and do they accept um, that, that they understanding of themselves and I have uh, recently been working with um, some people and um, this was where we started, the accepting the emotions, impulses, thoughts and behaviours um, and then move from that to, to a greater self-awareness and knowledge of, uh, of themselves and of their own trauma and, then will, and also willing to accept behavioural limitations and that's basically the model that we've um, talked about in terms of treatment. Both things, you've got to do both things. Okay, next. So this is kind of pulling together the ideas around denial. So there's a benefit to denial, and denial, if you if you don't deny, then you have to face up to things. And I have psychiatry friends who say denial is a wonderful short-term strategy, but very bad in the long term. Question about whether it, what is a road through denial, and uh, there's a book called Ch Deny Child Abuse, which I found really helpful. It talks about how do you get around the block of denial. Can you actually do behavioural stuff even though people deny? Can you say, well, I know you think you didn't do this, but this is a rule. You're not doing that. You can't. You have, they have to go to school. They have to do this. They have to do that. It's that same debate about how do you get change? Change behaviour first. Change belief first. Um, is confrontation the only or best way? Um, question. Uh, this came up yesterday in a, a post. It came through about. Um, a seminar here in Australia about gentle confrontation as a way of working towards change, going through the strategies. And what about when there's some unconscious blocking? How do you get that? How do you help people to understand what, what the issues are that are blocking them from being able to see their child in a different way and see themselves in a different way? So um, next slide, these cases are complex. And uh, I think that uh, the kind of things that make cases complex, we need to recognise in order to figure out not just doing intervention, stopping the action, but changing the potential of this happening again in a family and changing the capacity of the parents to be suitable for children. So looking at, um, you know, how can you interpret the symptoms, the needs of the child, the context of the family, how the family engage with staff and so how the staff engage with uh, families. I had one case where a paediatrician actually rang this mother and told them that, um, I was going out to pick up their child because we were going to place them in foster care. So he interfered in the protective system and part of that was that he had over-engaged with her. Um, the professionals involved can polarise. Um, in the 90s I was involved with a number of matters and we wrote up um, a, a, a sort of summary of polarisation. Um, in amongst the professionals, some people don't believe this nice family could possibly be harming their child. Um, some, in fact, we, we've supported a matter going to court and then the, the parents had an interview with the police and the caseworkers and they thought they were fun, wonderful parents and the rest of their children were doing very well, so clearly they couldn't have done this to this child. So it's that kind of complex interaction. Um, and, uh, of course, for us, we here have to look at um, principle of least intrusive action. So that means that one needs to think more deeply than just the behaviours. You know, and then there's the disbelief. I mean, can we believe that somebody might put, you know, a substance into a tube? And uh, I've seen tubes with holes in them, so I know that that happens. Do you want to make any comments on that, Des? Yeah, I was going to comment that different hospitals attract different audiences of these kinds of cases. The hospital that I worked at in North Carolina for many years had a nationally reputed GI service, and we had cases in which uh, children were being given syrup of Ipecac or laxatives and they I would be called by the GI service for these kinds of cases. And then our pulmonary service became more well known and got a, a few national experts that people were referring to and suddenly we started having pulmonary cases because these cases are very complex. They often get referred to uh, tertiary quaternary care medical centers where they can be worked on in more detail and often it takes extreme specialists in pulmonary medicine or neurology or GI. And I think the pattern of, or the spectrum of cases you'll see that at hospital reflects in some sense the spectrum of expertise that that hospital has. So there may be some hospitals that have more infectious disease, 
some that have more pulmonary disease manifestations, some that have more apparent um, GI disease or liver disease because that's those are the, the way they're doing the injury to the child results in manifestations which are thought to be in that specialist area. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. We've had the same similar position here. Kind of is about um, the almost a competition sometimes for in, in the complexity um, processes. So um, in in as I mentioned, I worked in a psychological medicine at the Children's Hospital, and uh, we had a number of referrals because they were a specialist hospital in, in this state, um, including some of these symptoms, epilepsy and urine retention, and, um, breathing problem, vaginal bleeding in a 10-year-old, abdominal pain, and some of those things um, fit on um, a spectrum. So the next slide, um, and this next slide talks about um, the continuum on which these occur. Um, and this is just a way that we wanted to conceptualise them. So some of them start with somatising um, symptoms that get a lot of attention. And if that's in a family where there's other relational issues, then you know the health set health setting can be quite nice to people if the rest of their life is horrible, um, or or they're not getting enough emotional support. So you know the risk goes on to where there's a deliberate um, creation of symptoms, um, and then the next one. Um, so what we did was map out symptoms along this continuum um, and to look at the ones that we were currently using doing that year um, and figure out where the risk was the highest. Now, of course, when the risk is very high, um, you need child protection interventions, you might need protective strategies, as in the children might be placed in foster care or placed with a family. Um, I guess the hypothesis we started to say is, is there some way of actually um, intervening early and figuring out um, whether you could prevent these things escalating? Next one. And so the, um, the, the British Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, I really like their documents, it's available online, but they use the language, a spectrum of presentations which identify presentation, iatrogenic harm, carer's insight, and underlying factors which contribute then to their um, pr proposals around a management framework. So um, this is kind of a step beyond um, stop the behaviour, it's a step beyond into understanding um, and figuring out whether, whether it's treatable. Um, and then the next one, um, so this is the way that we started to think about how we intervene where there's a medium to low risk and where there's no actual harm occurring. Um, which is always tricky because sometimes the harm is iatrogenic, not expected. It might be the mum gives the symptoms, she gets a medication, it causes an effect that wasn't expected. Um, so we've talked a lot about this, that the parents actually believe sometimes that their children are ill, they think they're going to die. And, and if they're already traumatised people, one of the signs of trauma is an over-exaggerated view of death. Um, and it may well be that that's associated with another kind of abuse that they experience. So they experience um, sexual abuse and they have an over-exaggerated um, view of, of death, um, that they, they're very fearful, they're very anxious, and then along comes a child with a symptom and all of a sudden it becomes bigger. And then if they're not believed or if they present to a medical system as being like this, the medical system might find it hard to, um, to uh, be, be comforting and supportive of them, and they struggle there to trust the parents. Um, some health professionals may become overly punitive or suspicious, and they may exaggerate their sense of what's gone on. Others may become overly supportive, and the polarisation, which I mentioned, can occur. And, uh, you know, in psychological terms, that means that anxiety can infiltrate the whole system. So that is in the treating system. So let me reassure you as well that I'm not turning into a just a psych psychological perspective on this, safety has to come first um, and we also need to have ongoing curiosity as a team and using teamwork. Um, and the next one um, is that, um, oh, next slide. Um, so our therapeutic approach kind of is, well was then, I'm not in that team now, but I still do some of this work um, separately, is that we need to engage with the family in a non-blaming and non- on punitive way, again, in places where safety is not currently an issue. 
So together you're assessing risk, staying alert to the possibility of being co-opted or enticed or triangulated. Um, and with a pragmatic focus on how the family functions. How do they actually work together? How do they respond if a child tells them that they're sick? Is this a child actually seeking um, more attention and nurturing because it's not available to them in another way? And uh, most of the time the work takes at least six months to two years, but that's the common kind of framework where there are um, distorted distress symptoms and behaviour. And then we have to understand the systems issues that maintain the behaviour, like the interactions in the family with an overfunctioning and underfunctioning parent, um, between the family and the health professionals, between different health professionals, and between different agencies. So the minute you put different agencies in, you get a whole bunch of different perspectives on what's happening in this family. So um, just my list of uh, the principles that uh, we use, the next one is um, a bunch of different therapeutic approaches can contribute and need to be in our box of family therapy, looking at models of attachment, understanding trauma and grief, understanding um, ways in which CBT might help to challenge the distorted cognitions, um, using motivational interviewing, looking at signs of safety, having narrative approaches. So um, I hope that's a helpful list. And then the principles that we use, the next one, uh, good communication, respect, transparency, being as open as possible and checking in regularly. These are people who need, who are very needy. They need to know that they're not being kept in the dark or that people aren't holding secrets. That the people involved are very clear about their roles and that they are working um, as a team. And so in order for safety, noticing and managing the symptoms of anxiety, containing the family, on ongoingly reviewing safety with a level of suspicion, but not overly so, so we haven't caught the system anxiety of the parents. Um, and uh, this concept about understanding and, and engaging in the anxiety, so getting close to it rather than avoiding it, because anxiety is tough for workers to deal with, it makes us anxious too. Um, and we always had somebody as a key worker that they could talk to. So we, we created an attachment process. So the questions then in understanding, in looking at child protection are what are the issues of neglect and abuse? How do we get, how and when do we engage them? Because the medical um, knowledge is not always um, understood by people in a child protection system. Um, and how do we communicate that? How dangerous it is? How do we have that um, analysis and uh, you know, I've been at a number of case conferences where they ask an expert to come and go, you know, how safe or unsafe is it for this child? What else do we need to do so we can actually make change in the family? And the need for an ongoing evaluation of risk and protective factors. So I just wanted to quickly go through how we uh, manage this case that we might uh, engage the parents, there might be an admission, we might name the anxiety and help them understand the story. We might contain the anxiety by regular appointments and if we need to set safety limits um, involve the child protection system and sometimes I think we, we haven't done that um, always as soon as we could have, particularly in one case I think of. Um, it's harder when the children get older, it's certainly in, in Australia. Not all, can not all cases be treated? Uh, is that true? Yep, I think it probably is true. Um, and particularly once we get down to the, the high risk levels. So um, I'm actually going to try, um, the next case that I'm going, next slide talks about a family that I was involved in um, many, many years ago. So it's de-identified, but the mother in this case went on the media and has told a little bit of her story. So I'm going to have a try at making this work. So um, uh, Des, if you can tell me if this is loud enough, that would did make it work. Here we go. Yes. I'll do what I ultimately have done. The, that I was just frightened that I should break, I suppose. Donna complained her baby wouldn't gain weight, was irritable and running a fever. But in hospital, Chloe showed no signs of being ill and was sent home. Her stomach kept getting bigger and bigger. Like a, and she, would, she never opened the bowels of that. They wouldn't believe me when I said it. Chloe was returned to hospital and a strange pattern began to emerge. Staff noticed every time Donna came to visit, the baby became ill. 
I didn't consider I was giving Kelly poison. I was trying to help her to make her to make her calm down, to try and make her stop fitting. Chloe had a heart attack and died. She was only three months old. Her parents refused an autopsy, but blood tests revealed the baby had been poisoned with lethal doses of prescription sedatives. Eight months after Chloe's death, Donna gave birth to another healthy baby girl named Rebecca. But within a month, the new baby was back in hospital. I made Rebecca sick so to get attention for her and to get, to get myself, I mean, it sounds really cruel to get myself out of the mess because I couldn't cope with the situation. I gave Rebecca some insulin to keep her in hospital. The um, doctor had said that if Rebecca's sugar levels were low, then they'd keep her there, but otherwise she had to go home. Rebecca's health deteriorated rapidly. She was suffering from the same illness as her sister Chloe. Doctors discovered the baby had been dosed with potentially fatal levels of salt at least twice, insulin at least nine times, and sedatives. Rebecca survived and is now three years old. She suffers from cerebral palsy, is almost blind, and may never walk or talk. She was so driven uh, by her own needs uh, for attention and uh, to, to feel important that she was prepared to sacrifice her children along the way. Psychiatrist Brent Waters believes Donna has a rare mental disorder known as Munchausen syndrome by proxy. A particular distorted form of parenting uh, where the parent uses the child to, uh, to get a particular sort of attention, medical attention, um, and by virtue of that uh, gets, uh, gets some degree of notoriety as being the parent of this child. So you would say that was your way of asking for help? Yeah, rather strange and convoluted way. Do you feel that you still suffer from your childhood? It's so hard to answer that. that the syndrome itself only um, comes out in certain circumstances. Like I sort of don't go around like some people might think being a monster all the time, sort of attacking babies and things like that. But under the certain stressful circumstances, it could be a problem. Do you agree you need treatment? I believe I need help, yeah. And I can't see that I can get that in jail. I'm seeing the psychiatrist, he's helping. If attention was what Donna was seeking, she got her fair share today. Judge Gibson said he had no other alternative but to jail her. How long Donna Balker will serve won't be known until next week. So this um, family um, took up quite a lot of my life. I had a particular role in this matter um, and uh, involved in the prosecution. So the next slide. Um, the two older children um, were uh, abused in the same way. They were given medication, insulin, salt poisoning and some shaking probably in hospital. Um, the twins were born three months pre prematurely, um, induced by the mother and she then told lots of lies to the neonatologist about these twins having the same condition as her, younger as her older children and that would have led to them getting uh, medication they didn't need. Um, and also someone interfe interfered with their, their feeding troops. So this is down one end of this spectrum um, and it was pretty tough really trying to figure it out. Um, next slide. So in fact what happened was that the mother was um, charged as you read but one of the issues was that um, even in jail there were still people who didn't believe that she did it and were wanting her to have contact and at contact visit she continued to poison one of her children by putting something on her fingers and that child developed some um, symptoms associated with that. And I guess for me I still wonder could it have been handled differently. Um, in that time I wasn't doing treatment, I was being uh, uh, somebody who um, who actually got involved in detection. Um, so there's, do you want to have a comment about that, that matter? Yeah, a couple thoughts um, popping in my head. One of which is that, um, you know, that this situ this, these cases are complex and sorting them out is um, and trying to get to the truth is kind of is very different for you know as a healthcare professional we're taught to trust the histories and and believe what's taught so the neonatologists that may have done extra investigations there's kind of a horror 
later when we discover that we've been party to and sucked into doing things to a child on the basis of things that are that weren't supposed to happen. And so we end up having probably a disproportionate horror to being involved in this compared to some other forms of child maltreatment. Um, the other thing is that sometimes children have complex illnesses that are a little mysterious and trying to sort out. And I've often said to my pediatric surgeon colleague, the fact that the pediatric surgeon doesn't understand the case doesn't automatically make it a factitious disorder, um, that we didn't need to be very careful and not jump to conclusions and to do a very careful workup. But at the same time, we need to think very carefully about um, the health consequences of the child and making sure that they're protected. Great. Thank you, Des. Now, um, uh, I know there's a couple more slides um, that are on my system, but I don't know that they necessarily add to the whole thing. So, um, Pragati, you want to move it to the thank you slide and then see what questions there are. Yeah, thank you, Sue and Des. Such an interesting topic, um, and we cover such a, a range of symptoms um, that are presented with the child and the parent, and it, it certainly is more of an investigative type of process than most um, cases of child abuse. So I um, have a couple of questions that I'd like to pose um, that were brought up by the, um, the viewers. The first one is, what do you think are the consequences of impunity in the child's mind when the true case of maltreatment is dismissed by justice or by child protective services? Um, I think it's really bad. Like, I think children need to understand that um, you know they have rights and they have uh, value and that they need to be um, looked after. Um, it's a very complex system and that's why um, I think we need to have a complex explanation um, and not dismissing that they have been abused um, and also explaining that, you know, I, I say this, don't want to say it glibly, but very, very rarely do parents decide they'll get out of bed and harm their child. In fact, tissue illness, it's, a, it's much more complicated than that because they often see themselves as overly caring, but they are very confused. And, and in that case that you just heard of, I actually had to. We actually got all those. The remaining three children adopted, and I had to explain to the older children um, that they would not be living with their mum. They were well attached to their foster carers, who fortunately they'd been with for the whole time, um, and they knew that they hadn't seen their mum and their dad, and that it was that they had done some really um, things that were dangerous to when they were younger, and that. Um, no one really quite knew exactly why they did that, um, but it was nothing to do with them. It wasn't their fault. It was to do with how um, what had happened to their mum and their dad when they were growing up and that that behaviour, we needed to keep them safe. So that's a simple version, obviously. But, you know, it's very hard to actually explain that to children when parents have harmed them, but they right. need to have an explanation. Right. Well, and to complicate that, I'll just add, this is Des, that the children, most of the children are actually very young at the time this happens, and so they're not in a position to kind of understand motivations or even understand what's happened to them. So yeah. it's a matter of later when they're a little older and in foster care, and someone yeah. explains to them or they have been adopted and it's explained what happened to them, it's a pretty mysterious process and pretty hard for them to understand what could possibly have been motivating a parent. Right. Um, it's a very complicated situation that clearly needs physical and um, mental health counseling. Um, another question we have is, what would be the role of the father, like assuming that the mother is the one that is the one causing the harm to the child? How is it that um, the alternate, the other parent, is not aware, and how would you describe um, how that whole dynamic? factors into um, the scenario? Well, there's one of the articles that I put onto the um, end of the, uh, the, the references is the role of non-perpetrating fathers in Munchausen syndrome by proxy. You know, I, I have to say that um, uh, sometimes fathers get off the hook when, when mothers are called, you know, to be the ones responsible in Munchausen. So you are talking to a female social worker here. Um, and my view is that uh, you know, sometimes they actually 
you know, dismiss their role. They don't see themselves as equal parents. Uh, one of the fathers recently used to go to the medical appointments where the wife reported the symptoms and never actually challenged them, never actually asked questions, just sat back and let it all happen. And it wasn't until the children were removed that all of a sudden he was absent and it was none of his fault. So I think that also is a very complicated dynamic um, and one that we need to be really careful of. If the fathers are present or in the household, um, and some of this, um, you know, abusive stuff is happening. Um, we we have to not let them off the hook. That's my view. Well, and I'll just add that the in my the cases I've dealt with, the fathers often were relatively distant, were off working. The mother was the one doing the childcare, and in fact, that may have been part of the motivation for kind of getting more attention, is that that person wasn't getting the kind of. Um, uh, support and attention that the spouse was getting in the workplace, and uh -huh. that was a reason for it. I had attended a really interesting presentation on this condition a number of years ago that was sponsored by the U.S. National Institutes of Health, and one of the presentations was by a woman who's at the National League of Nursing in the United States, as I recall, and she talked about the phenomena of nurses doing this uh, phenomena of injuring a child in order to be the angel of mercy, rescuing the child from the brink of death, and inducing things in the hospital, which I hadn't really thought much about before, but it was a presentation about the few relatively rare cases of nurses actually doing something to a child, blocking a feeding tube, uh, giving the child the wrong medicine, doing something to then be the position, person rescuing. And interestingly, there were several male nurses that were implicated in this in the, in the literature review that they presented. And to my knowledge, um, male perpetrators of, of this factitious disorder, Munchausen, aren't talked about very often. But here's the situation of men who took a very typical female job um, and then did the same kind of phenomena of suddenly trying to become the kind of the center, lifesaver centerpiece for this child. So it's interesting that the overlap might be with, with the few perpetrators in nursing that do this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the, another question we have is, as clinicians, what would you say is our role in working with young children and teenagers, um, especially as they grow up and, and do, this, do the same pediatricians and social workers often stay with that same case and child as they grow up so that as they do become older and are trying to process some of the, what has happened to them, um, how is the follow-up managed and, and what would you say is the role of clinicians in, in piecing it all together? I think the follow-up's rarely managed optimally, as in um, some of these families do move around a lot, and even if they're in foster care, our experience is that many children in foster care do not get optimal care, and that's even after serious brain injury. Um, they don't seem to be able to access the, you know, regularly the same um, medical or, or allied health social workers, counsellors because um, people move around and basically our health systems don't actually support that. I was fortunate that I worked in a public health setting where um, I was allowed to keep on seeing people and we did see them for more than six months. We sometimes saw them for years and, and I think that is an advantage in safety um, but I don't think that we have a good system for that. However, having said that, people like um, um, uh, you know, the psychiatrists and people involved in uh, ongoing trauma treatment would say that actually what we need to do is to help help family members and community to provide that kind of support. And it hasn't just got to be cognitive. It's about helping people to manage the impact on their bodies of their experience, having lots of activities, being part of groups with nice people who care about them, that stuff. And Bruce Perry says that stuff is as important as is formal in a room counselling. Um, and I think that's worth our while keeping on remembering that the community are the people who can provide this kind of ongoing support, if we can, for children and their families and carers. Mm. So it's, it's unclear sometimes what it is that we, we want the parents to actually acknowledge. Can you speak to that a little bit as to whether in most cases parents get to the place where they are able to admit that they have caused some of this harm or is that a rare circumstance? Um, well, as you heard that um, mom on that 
that film saying um, that she admitted to some of it, but she saw it as being totally related to stress. I don't disagree with that, but as adults we have responsibility for managing the things that cause us to do things. Um, and some of the mums that I've treated have admitted to, um, you know, exaggeration and they have admitted to um, being overly anxious about symptoms. but. There's no point going down and going through each symptom one at a time, which is my point, that you actually need to be working with helping the person to be the best they can be and to be self-aware enough that they're not actually um, uh, letting their un unconscious inverted commas or their ununderstood um, cognitions determine what they do. So figure out, so that's almost, um, that's a kind of a, an analysis that DBT talks about. It's like a chain analysis. What led to this behaviour? What are the things that came before it? What are the things that might have contributed to it? So there's some of that discussion that might help people to get to a point of, of admissions. Um, and the other bit is for people to understand what anxiety is and how to actually manage it in their body, what they respond to, because we know that that can then change their thinking. I don't think it's easy. Yes? I was thinking how lucky you are to have actually had many admissions of, of even partial guilt because my experience in these cases, um, even one situation in which we presented the case had a child actually being injected with air into the G-tube, the tube into the stomach on video and the father seemed very appreciative. Six months later, we were the bad people at the hospital that had made this case up against the mother and the father, neither the father or mother admitted that they were at all involved. Another case I had involved was a woman who had um, was she was a specialist emergency medical technician with an and I think had induced a pneumothorax in her child and denied anything. But she her parents um, were the were the grandparents of the child kind of stepped in and said we believe you. But everybody else in the family kind of closed ranks and thought it again it was the hospital picking on their family. But Des, I think that that's part of the dynamic of what happens with when people are pushed. So we have a system that pushes people to deny, and that's often the legal system. And so they have lawyers who say, you know, admit nothing. Um, then they get to a point of actually shutting down from uh, admission because that's too frightening. So they get into an anxiety and fear cycle. And they're often left on their own and not given, you know, the support to continue to deal with the dilemmas. And I, I think that's a system that we, that, that the health system and the legal system have created. And it's almost like they need to be in parallel. Yes, they need to be safe and they need to have therapy. And I think that's so with any kind of child abuse. We, we tend to go down one track and we don't tend to, uh, you know, I'm not saying that you um, pretend nothing's wrong, but uh, um, a couple of the papers that, Dr. Kozlowska and I have written, you'll see in that how we did that, we, we said, well, you need to help us explore what the evidence is for this because this is the evidence we've got. What do you think about that? So it's a totally different way of actually challenging people. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that, Sue. I think that's very valuable insight. Mm -hmm. And we're coming to the end of our time today. And again, um, I really thank everybody for joining us today. I'd like to bring everyone's attention to the handouts that are also available in, in this right-hand panel. Um, if you would like a copy of this, the slides, please um, download them um, on the right. If you have additional questions that you'd like to um, discuss with our presenters, please email them to us. There's an email on this web, on this last slide at resources at ispacan.com, at resources at ispacan.org, excuse me. And I just want to wrap up today by saying a huge thank you to Sue Foley and Des Runyon for today's webinar topic on abuse in medical settings. Um, it's an extremely fascinating topic and we thank you so much for your time today. A recording of this webinar will also be available to our members within 24 to 48 hours and it's going to be posted on our website. So um, we encourage you to share that if you um, would like with colleagues that you think might benefit from today's presentation. So we will just end today um, with a thank you and that you will also uh, receive a, a short questionnaire following the, the webinar um, to give us some feedback. 
so thank you again um, from ISPICAN headquarters. My name is Pragati Tamala and I am the executive director at ISPICAN. So we thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Des and Sue. Thanks, Des. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Pragati.